yeah, this is broken. You could just see the signs. It was like there's this blinking sign above the industry. It was like, this is broken. This actually needs disruption. Like we all love saying that word in Silicon Valley. This actually needs it. If we want to start, the right place to start is is where the idea came from for for Adam Limbs. Um And I genuinely think it'll be, I think this is interesting because it is in some ways so obvious and in some ways so elusive. Um, that's not a good version of the question, but I want to start with where did the where did the idea for Adam Limbs come from? Like literally, yeah, we're at the starting point. Let's start. There. Yeah, where where did it begin? <clears throat> uh, is a confluence of things. Uh, in 2019, when we were working on Bebo, we sold that to Amazon and Twitch. And at the time, I was kind of angel investing in some longevity companies. And you know me, right? I, I share that. I have that sort of crazy where I'm like, I want to live forever. I want to be the first human being in another solar system alive, ideally. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to give people the ability to live as long as they want, as healthily as they want. It's just been a big deal for me for a long time. And I had been looking at a bunch of prosthetics for that, basically. I remember your your first company. I don't know if it was your first company, but at least a, a major chapter prior to Bebo was a healthcare focused company, too. Yeah. So I guess what Adam Limbs is my fourth company technically as a founder or co-founder. And so my second one, yeah, it was called Prime. It was like the number one family health records app in the app store. I don't even know if you remember this, but yeah, back in the day, you know, <clears throat> which was a Tuesday, as they say, I uh, <laughs> myself uh, coded the entire back end for this app to reverse engineer all the patient portals in the country. So you could like scrape every your medical records from every patient portal and uh I started cutting my teeth, you know, on the healthcare system back then, like working with payers and providers and pharma and everyone. And it was just crazy because like at the time, he was with what, 10, 12 years ago, even back then, uh, it was just so obvious that like healthcare was not going to solve a lot of its own problems. So I was like, okay, well, let's, you know, take a tech approach to it. And uh, we, you know, we, we definitely did some really great things with that. We ended up shutting the business down the business model just wasn't really there, but yeah, no, absolutely. And then when we were running Bebo, you know, I'm doing this angel investing. And then I had a friend, um, her name is Mary. She's actually a Twitch streamer. And I met her through working on Bebo. And she, uh, I believe she's former army, I believe she's a former EOD. And so she, um, she hugged a bomb when she was active duty and it blew her arms off. And um, she's, she's incredible, by the way, like just as a human being, like she's definitely, <laughs> she's got the edge of someone you might expect in the army for sure. You know, she's got that yeah. humor, that dark humor. <laughs> uh, but you know, for the most part, like she plays video games on Twitch with her feet. She plays with an Xbox controller with her feet a lot of the time. And you know, other things too, but I remember just like asking her and a few other people, uh, hey, yo, it looks like you have limb loss, but you don't really use prosthetics. Like, why is that? And just straight up, everyone would say the same thing. Like, look, man, <laughs> You wouldn't know this, but like prosthetics are just dog shit. And like, that's what she's saying, right? You know, and I was just like, okay, I got to dig in. I got to double click on this and know what's so broken about this. And then, oh man, I mean, you know, we've talked about this a little bit behind the scenes, but it was just so crazy when I started finding out, like, what do you mean everyone still uses hooks from 1912? What do you mean they, for the most part, don't even use those hooks? It was just like insane. I don't understand, you know, why this is happening. And then when we dug into it, we found out why. And it's a lot of things, but yeah. Yeah, so I think it's a, Interesting that you so clearly started with a problem on this. So you started with prosthetics suck. That seems like they shouldn't because th we're surrounded by technological miracles. Like why hasn't somebody invented a better one of these? And there's all the, you know, structural market reasons or misalignment, you know, principal agent problem reasons why somebody might not have built a great one. But how did you go about that process of kind of being like, oh, no, there's like a really good solution here. D was this like a blind leap? Be like, fuck it. Or or did you kind of go through this <laughs> process of yeah. like, let me go like find the, you know, go on a quest to find all the different individual pieces of the best solution? Uh it, no, it was super, super circuitous. Like there it was not an obvious path for sure. I like I even, you know, multiple years into this journey still feel like I'm learning stuff every day about it. But you know, I guess the simple answer would just be. You know, I, I had looked at a lot of prosthetics, you know, like when you go on YouTube and you like see all those bionics videos or whatever, like, oh, check out this cool Terminator arm or check out, you know, whatever other arm that looks like it's it's like the breakthrough thing. And this person got a, bl a brain implant and they're able to control it. And then it just turns out all of it's like stuck in academia. Like none of that was were real products. And then when I finally started looking at the real products, I was like, OK, well, wait a minute. So. 
there's, there's no such thing as an artificial arm. It's all just like different manufacturers. Like one makes a hand, one makes a wrist, one makes an elbow. Uh, a prosthetist, a human prosthetist has to assemble it by hand still. And then like the socket that you actually put your residual limb or like your stump, whatever you want to call it in, that is still plaster cast molded by hand by a prosthetist. And they sell, send it to this other facility called Central Fab. And that takes three months to make it. And then you get it back and oh, it's a, you know, it's a rigid one-to-one -one form of your arm. And oh, you gained five pounds. Guess we got to do another one now. It's just like, I don't understand, you know, why, how is this still so backwards? And I don't know, you basically to get to the solution on it, then it was, okay, well, let's look at all the academic projects. It's let's look at all the products that exist out there. It's, it was definitely a lot of talking to other startups that had tried it and failed at it and what they saw, but I'll just be really straight. Like, I don't think anyone else put the recipe together. Uh, and I think that's why we had to step up and do it. Like just speaking openly and honestly, if, if someone else had done this, I probably would have just invested in it, you know? And, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy that we're doing it. This definitely feels like my life's mission in many ways, but it was slowly all that. And then one other huge thing, which was, you know, I, uh, I emailed a friend of mine and I just said, who is an industrial designer. And I just said, Hey, I don't really know a lot about industrial design and mechatronics and stuff like that. And, uh, she was like, oh, well, let me connect you with this guy, Doug Satsker. He used to, uh, lead a bunch of ID at Apple and, you know, right. Whenever you hear that from someone, I was like, Sure. Yeah. Okay. You know, <laughs> former ID lead at Apple. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, oh, he, he worked on the Bondi blue of the iMac, you know, like chose that color and stuff. I was like, yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. So Doug and I just talked to them about their ID the whole time. You should fix this, this, and this. No, we, uh, we got coffee and we chatted for four hours. I had never met the guy before. And I was just like, we just like, you know, so fell in business love, so to speak. Um, and uh, ID uh, equals industrial design in this context, yeah. correct? Okay. Yeah, yep, yep. So, you know, the people who are responsible for not just the look, but the, the feel and also of a product, but also like everything from materials to colors to services to part lines to tolerances, you know, that's a, a lot of work back and forth between ID and <clears throat> mechanical engineers and electrical engineers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Doug just kind of shared the exact same vision, man. And we were just like, okay, well, we feel like two peas in a pod. Let's go get some more peas in this pod. <laughs> and, uh, then he, um, he, he emailed a buddy of his who was also ex Apple. And then that guy led us to another gentleman named Eric Monsef, um, who created the core hardware team at Apple, which is like 250 deep engineers. Uh, and he ran, um, portables at, at, at Apple. So MacBook, um, all that stuff. And then now those two super fine gentlemen are my co-founders uh, and the rest is history. That's incredible. I, I, I love that we are seeing the sort of budding of an answer to a question that I feel like people ask each other all the time, which is like, what if Apple built X? What if Apple built Y? Like, what if the talent, <laughs> the talent and discipline and stuff that go like, why can't everything be as incredible as an Apple product. There are so many, I mean, computers and phones are incredibly important. And I realize not everything, not every device has to have that level of polish and finish on it. But like, this is definitely a market that deserves that kind of craftsmanship and quality. I kind of, yeah, I agree. I feel like it's the, almost the inverse. Like, yeah, not everything deserves that level of craft and finish, but everything deserves at least a, a pretty high class level of, of good finish and polish to it. But what we always say is just like, wait, we have electric cars, we have reusable rockets, like and we literally have generative AI now, like, why don't we have artificial limbs? It's just the tech is literally there. Why wouldn't you do it? And yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I think it's, um, it, it's, it's kind of a bizarre question, but I think it's really, um, I think you are an interesting case in like, as you say, you started this hardware company, this incredibly technical business without necessarily having that experience yourself. And so, you know, I kind of want to ask, like, who, who did you have to be to this company and how do you, I don't know, I, I, I like, I want to explore and share that because I think it's an important thing to internalize for a lot of people. No, I'm, I, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's actually a, like a really under discussed topic in Silicon Valley, even, you know, it's, <clears throat> people kind of not you, the willingness to step outside of your own lane to do something that's, you know, kind of bigger and more important than yourself. And for me, sure, like academically, you know, 15 years ago, I got a degree in psychology, 
with a minor in neuroscience. And yeah, I, like I kept up with neuroscience since then, but I'm not a, a neurosurgeon. I'm not a neuroscientist. And, you know, yeah, I built cars and stuff growing up, you know, around the house, but like, I'm not a mechanical engineer, you know, I can't sit in CAD and do that stuff. And, uh, so, you know, someone asked me once, um, Hey, you know, you got these really amazing people on your team. How do you get these people on your team? It's just kind of part of this question. And I just told him, I was like, Honestly, man, the greatest people in the world, the, be the best talent in the world wants to work on the greatest challenges in the world. And that's how you get them. And, you know, like, I don't think me and Eric and Doug and, and everyone else on our team uh, would want to work on, you know, a photo sharing app right now. I think we want to work on something that's really impactful to people. I mean, you know, everyone, most people on our team have had the opportunity to work on these huge scale products that billions of people use. And that's what we want to do here too. So for me, I think the key that unlocked it was like, I just got to be willing to step outside myself on this. And the phrase I always use is, uh, I don't know if I've ever shared this with you, but like, I just take myself to school on it. You know, I, I'm not going to go to uh, university and learn this stuff, but I can definitely just read a lot of blogs, talk to a lot of people, interview a lot of experts, uh, hire some of the best people. Um, I can't, I can't take my hands off the wheel, right? I can't, as that, what's that phrase where it's like, just hire great people and let them do their thing or something like that. It's like, yeah. Eh, okay. You still got to provide direction, right? Like <laughs> coach K didn't just like get the best players. It was like, go, go play the game, do have fun. You know, you still have to help people and guide them and direct them. But uh, it's it's definitely a lot of, for me, a lot of humble pie a lot of the time. You know, I ask a lot of questions a lot of the time. I don't, it's probably like my job is probably like 20% giving direction and 80% gathering feedback and advice for the right direction on, on what to do. Yeah, I think there's a, um, like, did you watch Ted Lasso? Yeah, totally. We just finished season three, actually. Yeah, yeah. Amazing ending, by the way. Amazing ending, amazing show. Um, I, I have like related to that a lot and i i hear that a little bit in a, as an analogy here of like you don't have to know you have to be a deep deep expert in the thing if you can like there's a there's a meta skill in assembling the team and setting the vision and helping everybody kind of you do need the right people and you do need them to work together well um but i think there's a lot of talk in the valley of, about like well, you, you need to be the deep technical expert or you need to have spent your life in that market or whatever. And I think you're, you're a great example of an inspiration of like, no, I just saw a really big problem. And then you did the hard work to go find the people who had the skills, not just so, some people, but like the very best maybe in the world to go and tackle this. And when you start with those starting conditions, like, yeah, the snowball keeps rolling. Of course, more incredible engineers are going to want to work with those guys at their company get firsthand experience with them. Yeah, I feel like what you're talking about here is like, to me, it's like respect, you know, like <clears throat> in this case with prosthetics, I have to respect the problem space. I have to respect that I have all my limbs and I'm not someone with limb loss. I have to respect that I'm not an industrial designer, an electrical engineer, and those people know way more than me. And I definitely have to respect the fact that like, we're stepping into a space that a lot of people have really tried to innovate in. And we're not trying to, you know, say like, that all the innovations that came before us, you know, weren't necessary. But I think we're also saying at the same time, like, hey, you kind of got to bring this team together to do this, to your point. Like, you can't full respect to like Waterloo students and stuff like that, that we all love and talk about all the time. Like, you couldn't get a team of like 50 Waterloo students and solve this problem in this way. You have to get people who know, like we, you know, with Eric, for example, our CTO, you know, he knows everything from supply chain to logistics, to operations, to really his job is more like chief engineer than a CTO. You know, he's in the trenches every day with our engineers and he has the same respect for like, look, we, we got to find the right way to do this in a high class way, in a sophisticated, sophisticated way. This can't just be, you know, baby's first prosthetic sort of thing. It's, it's really got to be, a, it's not just a breakthrough. It's a statement piece. It's got to say to people like, we've got you, right? Like it has to, seeing an image of it, seeing someone use it has to communicate to potential customers, look, we're doing this in a different way. And part of that is we see you as a whole person, which comes from respect. Like it can't just be the way it is today. I don't even know if you know this, but like prosthetics today, as a person with limb loss, you can't buy a prosthetic. Like sure, you could maybe go get like a 3D printed one from some of those kind of like trendy startups that are making them for kids. But like, you can't just go to the companies that make them and buy them. You have to get a prosthetist 
to buy it for you because that's the way the prosthetists and those companies have set it up. There's no such thing as a, a relationship. You as a person with limb loss don't have a relationship with the person that made or the company that made your hand and your elbow. You have a relationship with the prosthetist that makes it. So one of our first things we said was like, well, okay, frankly, that's BS. Like that's insane. I bought my car with an app. I bought my phone with an app. I buy my groceries with an app. I mean, I go to the grocery store. I'm not that, <laughs> I go outside. Anyway, you know what I'm getting at, right? Like it's just, it comes back to respect. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, I, I remember, I think I remember where I was the first time I saw an image of the, of the Adam limb. And I think like you guys have done to, exactly to your point of like the respect and the scale that you were going after and the quality bar that you set from even the very beginnings of this company when it was nothing just like showing how high your bar for success was and what you expected that product to be um and if you haven't like i i pull it up on my phone sometimes i show it to people like at, at a party or whatever it's like look at this company like when they're just kind of like sometimes people pull your string on like what cool shit's going on like if they know that you pay attention to what's happening in the future and i'm just like i pull it up and it's, there's no better visual representation yeah go to atom adamlimbs.com and just like look at the renderings and the graphics there and it shows just how cool this thing could be it truly like and it should be right like yeah. there's no reason it shouldn't be i if don't know why they can't look like that today and if you're making like what could be more worthy of respect like you're making something that's about to become a part of a person's body like yeah the ultimate wearable as we say yeah yeah like uh, how like how much higher of a calling to craft and quality could you possibly expect okay well first of all i think i gotta send you like your referral code for every time you show this image to someone <laughs> 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 we'll set up that loyalty program in the background <laughs> perfect I, and then people ask me like well can they attach third arms fourth like do i need to be limbless in order to partake in this incredible prompt no. i mean that's the thing too it's like I remember one of the first conversations you and I ever had about some of this stuff was actually about the tele operation of it, you know, the remotely controlled operation. So, you know, yeah, a person with limb loss can wear it. But if you don't know how the product works right, the, basically the way it works is you put on this cuff of electrodes around your stump. It's not invasive. They just sit on your skin and then, you, you know, you train it with machine learning and then the arm just moves. It's attached to your body over that and you wear it, it just attaches to a shirt that you wear that we designed. And um, and that's it. But what the, the implication of that is that you can control it wirelessly because it's already wireless. So what that means is like I can send you the cuff, Eric, and you could control the arm here in our lab right now. We should have done that, by the way. Why did that's we do that? So cool. I could just be like poking <laughs> anyway. you in the side of the head. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Eric needs my attention. Sorry, I'll be right back. <laughs> like, Stop tickling me or I'll put you across the room. Uh, that's fantastic. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think it's um, I, an underrated piece of what you're building or underrated uh, aspect of it is, which gets back to kind of the, the starting conditions of the company, is how many different technologies you needed to assemble in order to actually deliver this product, right? It's not one innovation. Um, you said you had to sort of like search out all these different academic research and previous startups and like how... I, I, I don't know. I would love a little more detail on that process. Like, is it a giant checklist? Was it just like pilot it all on the table and figure it all out? Like, how do you, how do you actually go about it? Because I think this skill is so underrated of like, identify a big problem, be mad that someone hasn't invented a better version of it, then go look at all, like all of the various pieces and technologies that exist already that you would just need to assemble into a product to deliver to market. Like, these opportunities are everywhere. And so I, I, we, we, I think we can't be too detailed about like going through that process and showing people kind of what you learn and abstracting it a little bit. Yeah, because it's a lot to your point. I think, you know, what are all the just high level summary real quick? What are all the different technologies that we've had to integrate and incorporate to do this? I mean, one, you know, breakthrough robotics first. Uh, two, neural interfaces, non-invasive neural interfaces. Three, <clears throat> just AI in general, right? I mean, <clears throat> in this case, machine learning, a lot of dynamic machine learning, things like dimensional scaling, stuff like that. Four, wearables. You, ha you have to wear this thing. You know, people wear these really uncomfortable harnesses today. Uh, we can't do that. We're not going to put a strap on your body that tugs on your armpit all day. That's, that's painful. Uh, five, um, everything from <clears throat> the clinical side. So, 
you know, how does this thing get re reimbursed? How do you bill for it? What stakeholders do you have to work with to do that? Uh, and then you just kind of do a laundry list after that of like, well, we have, it's a medical device technically, so it has to get cleared by the FDA. Um, you know, prosthetics, prosthetic arms are predominantly class one devices today. So it's not like a super high burden, but you still got to do it. So like, what did I know before I came into this? Uh, let's see. I'd made some really <laughs> cool software apps that a lot of people <laughs> used, you know, <laughs> like, I definitely had appreciated scale. Uh, cause like a discuss back in the day, I mean, I think I left like right after we crossed like a billion users or something like that and 10 million websites. So it was pretty huge. I definitely understood that and how to grow things, but. And that's why we have a wait list today. Of, actually, I don't even know if you know this, by the way, but the wait list just crossed over 11,000 people. But, Holy uh, shit. Yeah. That's so huge. Like, uh, yeah. Something like 200, just over 200 million in forecast revenue, which wow. gets back to your point of like, okay, so when you integrate all this stuff and when we integrate all this stuff, get into the details now. So <clears throat> with the robotics, one of the first things we said was like, okay, we want this thing to have every degree of freedom. I mean, you can control the elbow, the wrist and all three degrees of freedom. So rotation, adduction, abduction, flexion, extension, um, and then fingers. And that was like the big thing no one had done before. I mean, there's many things <laughs> they hadn't done before, but one of the biggest was certainly individual finger control. We said we wanted to do that. We're like, okay, well, how do you do this? Uh, because if you want to, for example, like just bend your fingers over at the joint that connects to your hand and that's it. Uh, okay, sure. You could do that with a prosthetic hand today. You could do that with a robotic hand. What if you want to get like a, like a book grip though? What if you want to, you know, get a kind of a combination of things that happen with using the different flanges of your fingers? So we're like, okay, that means we can't put actuators in the forearm that just tugs strings on the fingers like everyone else does basically, or in the palm, we have to actually put motor actuators in the fingers. And by the way, we're trying to make this thing for 25th percentile adult female size and up. So like, imagine like a five foot two woman or, or man, I should just say, you know, five foot two person. Um, and like, that's a smaller hand. Uh, and so how small do these motor actuators have to be? And we went out and we talked to everyone we knew, Japan, China, Mexico, Germany, everywhere who, do, who makes these motor actuators, all the companies we know, no one had made a small enough motor actuator with all the things we would need, like built in encoding so you could talk to it uh, and, you know, a really high gear reduction ratio. So we just designed it because, you know, they were even telling us like, hey, you know, if you guys make this, maybe we'll want to buy it from you too. Like on the side, it's like, oh, okay, well, maybe there's a second <laughs> business opportunity here. Put that to the side for a second. <laughs> Let's just focus. But so even on just that one thing alone, that was probably like months, right, of back and forth with dozens of people to try to figure it out. And looking back in hindsight, of course, now, right, yeah, we've gotten all this preclinical data, people have tested the arm, it's, you know, we're nearing a production intent design and all that. So it seems like, oh, it was really easy, but <clears throat> no one knew those pieces before we did that. And you could say the same thing about the wearable and the neural interface. The neural interface, I think, is probably, you know, the second greatest challenge. And I think the wearable is the third greatest challenge. The wearable, it being the shirt and the socket, you know, we had to do everything. We've looked at everything from 3D printing or additive manufacturing to um, all the materials you can put on someone's body. So you have to understand, okay, everything from like, it has to <clears throat> wick sweat away. It has to be breathable. It has to be light. The whole thing has to be light. And I know, you know, you know this, we've talked about this. The whole arm is only a few pounds, which even on that front, okay, so you double click on weight and then maybe I'll shut the hell up for a second. But, you know, so we look at the weight of this thing and, you know, we look at all these amazing arms that are being concepted in academia for this stuff that re receive all this like government funding and stuff. These arms are like 10 pounds, 15 pounds. The average adult's hu human's arm is uh, five percent of your body weight. So if you're a hundred pounds, each of your arms is about five pounds. If you're two hundred pounds, each arm is about ten pounds. But there is a big difference between weight and perceived weight. If I took a five pound weight and hung it on your shoulder, it's uh, you're going to lean, right? You're going to get like musculoskeletal issues if I do that. So we got to find a way to preload a bunch of that weight, and that's why we went so deep on saying, okay, everyone else is making these harnesses just throw it away. Like there's no way you can keep using those. No one wears their prosthetics because these things are so uncomfortable. Uh, and so, but what if we ask ourselves, like what if we use the whole surface area of the torso? Wait a minute, that's a crazy concept no one's ever done before. But well, actually, yeah, you could just put some semi-rigid materials into a shirt uh, and keep it kind of st stationary on someone's body and then attach the socket to that a price, apply some preload to it, you know, kind of snug it up to someone's stump. And all of a sudden, you know, our arm is, uh, I think about four pounds right now, the prototype is, 
And that four pounds, you know, could start to feel like three pounds, two pounds, one pound, you know, and you diffuse the load and the forces across the whole uh, torso. And then you apply a little preload. And the first thing we see, we had a guy come in who was literally leaning, like lit, walking in, he was literally leaning. And we were like, oh man, this is, <laughs> is going to be a hard one. And uh, he was, he took his prosthetic off and he, he kind of leaned back towards center a little bit, but he was still leaning. And then when he put the Adam Touch prototype on, he was still leaning and literally Doug just looked at him. He's like, yo, dude, you know, you can stand up straight with this. Right. And he was like, oh, oh, oh. And he stood up straight. He's like, oh, my God. And he he didn't even think he'd been so indoctrinated into thinking like that's just the way it is. His body was used to it. And then he starts walking around the office and he's got a much more normal gait, you know, as he's walking. And yeah, I, I just think you got to go as deep as possible on all this stuff to your question. It's an incredible, you know, just hearing you talk through those. It is there are so many constraints or parameters that you need to think about like when it's in full physical contact with somebody for every waking minute of their life for the most part like man the constraints on that are are so hard were there were there times where you like did you go in knowing all this or or would you were you like some of these walls in the maze that you like bumped off of you were like oh shit that's a new constraint that we hadn't thought about <laughs> I don't think I knew almost any of this before I came. <laughs> uh, I feel like yeah. definitely, <clears throat> I don't know. I'm a Tyler 2.0 call it or something. You know what I mean? Like it's just uh, having to learn kind of at least a little bit of everything to be dangerous, you know, everything from mechatronics to um, machine learning to neural interfacing. And then I think a big part of that, maybe got to, to the spirit of your question is like, what's all the stuff that we're also not doing right now that we've had to get really sharp on. So like, with the neural interface, for example, the cuff, it's not invasive. Okay, is it always going to be non-invasive? I don't know, but you know, survey says probably not, right? Because if you want to write data back to the body, then what do you do, right? You can't you can't send fields into your arm from the outside and like into the nerve. You got to actually get in the nerve at that point, and that stuff's so far away. But you know, that stuff's got to happen too. So we kind of like have a little bit of line of sight to that kind of stuff. We design it. Uh, like how we designed the arm modularly too, you know, so they're like, um, coming out with the above elbow configuration first and then come out with the below elbow in the hand soon after that. Yeah. I, I like the, your approach to do the hardest one first. Um, and, and hopefully like roll, <laughs> sure, roll yeah. downhill after that. Um, I think it, yeah, so totally. if, I remember you telling me like everybody, every limbless person sort of no matter how and when they lost it has still like that that ghost feel ghost limb or perception of a ghost limb which is what helps train the um train the ai and train the to control the arm is, is there i hadn't i hadn't like really viscerally sort of put myself in that position but if you're using this is your only feedback loop as you say like feed information back to the body is the feedback loop just mainly visual like if they're not watching what the arm is doing or, or they just can like trust that the limb is obeying to some extent like i'm yeah i mean i guess there's maybe what two questions in there one is like how do you control it and is it only visual feedback uh and the other well i guess i'll just talk to that one first so do you know what proprioception is have we ever talked about this proprioception is kind of known in <clears throat> as like your sixth sense sort of uh, and it's the it's that your body knows where your limbs are, even when you're not looking at them. And that's because you get all this, you know, feedback from your muscles. So your brain knows where you think your your arms and your legs are. So like if you put your hand under a table and you wave it around, you still can kind of feel where it is. So y there is a little bit of proprioception that uh, happens when you wear a prosthetic arm that is sufficiently embodied. So like if you use a hook arm today, you really aren't going to get that because it's, you know, just kind of off balance and there's not really a lot of comfort to it uh it's not really snugged up to you um but with ours we we hear people saying that sometimes and one of the things that we actually start seeing is uh people will, like start gesturing with the arm like they'll just like be talking. subconsciously yeah subconsciously that's so cool that's so wild it, it honestly the first time we saw it we actually like literally stopped the person that was doing it we're like hey just real quick like uh was that on purpose or like is that like an error in the arm and they're like well what what do you mean and we're like well you're gesturing while you're talking right now uh and they were like oh my god well no i just i guess i was doing it naturally yeah it's that's the craziest so thing. wild that's so fascinating, man. Um, how cool. So, so you're now in the stage where you, it sounds like are getting to, uh, sort of bring people in and pilot things. Like what's the, the situation as we, as it is today in Adam? 
Yeah, let's see. So we've been going just over 24 months full steam. Uh, and in those 24 months, basically now, yeah, we're la- we're nearing our production intent design um, and uh, rapidly approaching clinical trials now. But um, so basically about 12 months ago, we started testing the arm on people, you know, super controlled test environment here at headquarters and stuff, but bringing people in. And so far, fingers crossed, but so far uh, of all of our, I think it's like 35 or 36 test users at this point, all 100% have controlled all their joints. And they all have above elbow limb loss, which is considered the hardest level to try to get fine motor control, like with the fingers, sort of unprecedented. So yeah, they're moving their elbows, the wrists, the fingers. They got there's the touch feedback in there, kind of to your previous question about, you know, it's not just visually controlled. It's also I don't think most people would really think about this, but like a lot of your motor control of your limbs is is touch driven, right? You know, it's nice when you can pick up a glass without having to look at it, which comes from this thing called pre-programmation, where you've done it a thousand times before. You know, babies, you know, they play with their environment, so they can kind of start to predict it. It's it's prediction and pattern recognition at the end of the day. I thought it was, I always thought it was really clever. You have this beautiful image. Um, I, I don't remember if it's in your deck or on your website, but of like a young woman holding like with a, with the Adam oh, touch like limb, glass. holding a wine glass. Yeah. And it, it really made me stop and think like how hard mechanically that problem would be like to know what substance you're picking up, how much pressure to apply. Um, it, yeah, it just really like got me thinking about it. And, and also just like, taking for granted like of course these like kind of older dumber limbs can't like even if you could hold something like you're not about to pick up a wine glass with a hook or or like a dumb sort of high pressure thing like i don't even know what you would call it but like the the amount of activities that a smart like device unlocks is incredible yeah it's uh I, you know, I think that was maybe kind of like your question a, a few minutes ago. Maybe the most surprising thing to me was not actually all the features we knew we were going to intentionally unlock. So individual finger control, sophisticated touch feedback with haptics, stuff like that. We knew we were going to do that. But you know how like how Apple is always like, oh, it's hardware and software. The marriage of hardware and software is, <laughs> you know, makes things great. And like, yeah, it's, it's true. I would agree with that. But like you can you could definitely get a little too navel gazy saying stuff like that. <laughs> But with this, it turned out that when we integrated the hardware and the software together in a whole arm, not just like a hand that has to connect to someone else's wrist, to someone else's elbow, to someone else's controls, we can just do stuff that literally people, other people can't do. So like auto leveling. So like when you're drinking that wine, you know, that's just an image you saw. But if if we showed a video of someone doing that, you can control or sorry, you could, the arm will keep the wine glass levels. So like as you move your elbow and your wrist around, it'll keep the hand parallel with the ground so you don't spill it, which, you know, we're not taking away control from the users in doing that. They have to activate that mode still, and they know it's happening because there's a video display even on the forearm. So you can always see what the arm is trying to do. Oh, but, uh, you that's just, you awesome. Can't. I didn't know that. Did you not know there was a video display? No, that's so yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, totally. <laughs> I know I'm like dropping all sorts of announcements here today, evidently. <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'm always surprised and delighted. I feel like there's so many like cool things to uh, this is why this is why this is why we do this. Um, because there's always fun things. Yeah, how to much learn fun do you about. have doing this? You get you get to I, invest in like dozens of companies that do stuff like this. I mean, you can tell how excited I'm like rocking in my seat learning about all these <laughs> fucking things. This is so cool. Um, yeah, I think th- th- there's just so many there's so many exciting things um about what you guys are doing and the like implications of it for so many people yeah i mean that's i remember i i listened to the um the show that you and bo and al did was like a week or two ago where you're talking about q2 and q3 investments from last year which is a great episode by the way man you guys were firing on all cylinders <laughs> <laughs> featuring adam limbs uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I like scrub in, you know, listening the second time and I'm like, okay, did I catch this right? And, uh, Tyler, Tyler's just, just like making talking. sure we didn't say anything too stupid about him and his company. Um, <laughs> so like, did you yeah. reveal any trade secrets, Eric? Um, the answer is not always yeah, no big no. deal. Just like, I'll send you the patents for next time. You can just, yeah. you can just put the PDF up on screen share. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anything for content, right? Okay, so we we've done a lot of like technical stuff in there. I think um I'm I'm curious about the the market and distribution side also. Um I mean you said there's a huge wait list. I'm 
not at all surprised that there's like a line absolutely out the door because people who need this need it badly. Um, but I imagine this is a kind of a complicated go to market as you alluded to. So I, I would love to just like talk about the discovery and process around that too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually funny enough that I remember what I was going to say a second ago, uh, that d- dovetails into that, which is, you know, you had mentioned on the, that previous episode where you were talking about your Q3 investments, you talked about us a little bit. And I remember you saying, you know, it's actually not as, as small of a market as a lot of people think. Uh, it's actually quite a big market. And that was also surprising to me when I really got into it. I was like, wait, 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 there's a hundred million people in the world who have limb loss. I was like, there's, there's in the U S there's 4 million. Like that's crazy. And now it makes sense when you think about the fact that a lot of people lose like toes and fingers and stuff. So that's where a lot of it comes from. And with legs, legs outnumber, leg loss outnumbers, limb loss, arm loss, like 10 to one because diabetes is just, you know, but okay. So anyway, uh, you know, the market and, and the wait list and all that. Yeah. You know, it was crazy, man. When we first started telling people about this. So the, the wait list is now over 11,000 people. Um, I think I mentioned this to you in the past, but our wait list was got broken at one point because of like a thousand people over a couple months signed up. Uh, and they said they wanted a leg and we were like, yeah, well, but we're making an arm, (laughs) you know, like, or at least for now, like, you know, we'd love to make a leg, but we haven't announced anything. We haven't said anything. And literally people are just like, look, if this arm is as good as you say, as it looks like it is from what I'm seeing in these videos and stuff. Yeah. Make a leg. I want a leg from you guys. It's like, okay, now we got to create a separate leg wait list is the greatest problem to have in the world, right? Oh no, we have to create another wait list. But with the, with the market, um, it's, it's a lot. I think the three things that always come to mind for me when I think about this group of people is community is, and I say community on purpose, you know, I use market and like pitches, sure, but it's really a community because one, it is so many people. It's way more than people think. Like in the US, just arm loss, 350,000 people have lost part or all of their arm. And, you know, think that's 350,000 people walking around using a hook or nothing at all. Like, what, what do you, that's just, that's tragically underserved at that point. Which is the second thing I was thinking about this market is like, I remember in 2019, or is this 2020? So, yeah, no, summer of 2019, like two or three months after we sold Bebo to Twitch. Uh, and, and I didn't go to Twitch. Uh, like the whole team went and I, I didn't go for any specific reason other than I just wanted to start Adam Limbs. Um, I love Twitch and, and Amazon and, and the whole team and everything. But uh, I went to this conference called the Amputee Coalition Conference. Did I ever tell you about this? Okay, so... The Amputee Coalition Conference, annual conference, it's like the biggest gathering of industry and community uh, around amputation of limb loss. So you basically get, you know, a few thousand people who have limb loss show up and then kind of all the big players and the small players in the space. And I went and uh, I didn't know if I wanted to st- actually start Adam Limbs yet. I was still thinking of in- trying to invest in a company. I met some really cool companies at the time. Um, but the joke that I remember everyone saying, who had arm loss, none of them had a prosthetic on, like a few did, but most didn't. And I was like, Hey, can I just ask you, like, you don't know me. I don't know you. I'm just some dude from Silicon Valley walking around here, fully respect that. I probably have no fucking idea what I'm talking about, but like, can you tell me why you're not wearing a prosthetic? It just seems like you'd want to wear one. Uh, and literally the joke everyone would say is like, Oh yeah, I got a great myoelectric arm at home. Uh, it's in the closet. Let me go get it. I'll show you like that. They just weren't wearing them. Cause they're so underserved. And I was like, oh my God, they're making a joke out of the fact that they're underserved because they're like, is this like Stockholm syndrome at this point? Like, I was just like, this is crazy, you know? And then the third thing is, okay, so there's a ton of people and they're super underserved. And, and this was like the confluence of these three things was kind of what unlocked the business case for me. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe we actually need to start a company around this. The two ends of the spectrum of devices you can get today as someone with arm loss are either you get a $26,000 hook. That's the average price for a hook arm, $26,000. Oh my God. For just like a glob of plastic. Yeah, right. It's like, well, how much is like $10 of plastic and $50 of metal in there? Like, well, I don't know what, whatever they're smoking, I want it. And then, (laughs) or on the other end of the spectrum, you could get one of these kind of state of the art, quote unquote, you know, myoelectric arms. That's what people, when they say bionics, that's usually what they're talking about. The term of art in the industry is myoelectric because it's listening to your muscle signals to control it. Um, The average price is $195,000. Like you could buy two Tesla Model X plaids for that these days. You know what I'm saying? For one arm that can only open and close the elbow, 
rotate the wrist, not the other degrees of freedom of the wrist, and open and close the hand, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, into five fixed grips. Can't control the fingers. So it was like, okay, this is, yeah, this is broken. You could just see the signs. It was like, there's this blinking sign above the industry. It was like, this is broken. This actually needs disruption. Like we all love saying that word in Silicon Valley. This actually needs it. Full respect to everyone in the industry who's done amazing things for so many people who need what they need. But it's just like this, this stuff should have been done 10 years ago and no one's doing it. So we're just going to step in and do it. And it's such a clear call to an entrepreneur that's like, you could absolutely kick everyone in this market's ass. Like a, a competitor slide doesn't even make sense. Like it's just <laughs> no, it's sure. like what you're pursuing is like an unprecedented improvement and, and the technology exists to do it and that that's the bar that you're setting. And I, I love that kind of approach because if you build what you think you can build and you're well on the way, that you absolutely own the whole market, like basically instantly, like that's the, I love that as a bar, as an approach to a market. I, yeah, it was kind of like once we started doing it, I felt the same thing. And I was like, I never want to do another business that doesn't meet that threshold again. You know, it's like the most addicting thing. Like, oh, my God, why aren't more people in Silicon Valley doing this kind of stuff? And I, th I honestly think we should like as a as an industry, as a region of the country, <laughs> like I definitely think more people could probably spend a little bit less time working on a lot of things they're working on right now and more on some really big problems that could make them, by the way, even more money than the stuff they're working on right now. So it's, you could do well by doing good and, and the inverse. It's a whole herd of contrarians roaming around, working on all the same shit at all the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a contrarian. Well, I'm a contrarian too. Wait Let's a hang minute. out together. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, oh my God. Okay, so one of the things that I, I uh, always enjoy about you and uh, appreciate deeply and, and hope to like amplify um, one of your, your traits is just the incredible, uh, long-termism of, of a lot of your thoughts, like both relative to Adam and well beyond. So, I mean, I think you alluded to like this earlier being the first person alive outside the solar system or living to a thousand or whatever. So, um, you know, I often sort of ask people like, what do you, where do you envision your product, your innovation, your company, like, what is the best case? Or what is the 50 year scenario? Like, where can we get in that amount of time, which it does really stretch it. Um, 50 years is a long time with with compounding technology. But like, I know you thought about it. Me? Never. No, obviously <laughs> not. Now, yeah, I boy, 50 years. I don't know. But let's just say the future, right? Just whatever, pick an indiscriminate amount of time more than 10 years from now and less than a million. And that's the same difference at that point. So like, I think probably I, check me on this if you disagree with this or if you think others do. I think most people, for the most part, could squint and see that 100 years or so from now, like we're going to have artificial limbs, bodies, types, things like, you know, it's we've got all this other cool stuff. We've all seen enough science fiction. I think people know that kind of thing is probably going to happen when it's going to happen and who's going to do it, I think, is the question. So to me, I think, OK, well, this is not even the first inning. This is the zero inning. This is we're making we're, we're catching this industry up for this community and market of people who desperately need this catch up but then it's really everything that comes after that that's that's the, the, the real work which is okay 50 years i could probably say like 10 years from now 20 years from now 50 years from now 10 years from now assuming exponential innovation ugh, don't hold me to this but 10 this years is, from now this like, is all pencil we're, we're just here to speculate wildly <laughs> this if, if this if we had a name for this segment it would be wild irresponsible speculation if that makes yeah. you feel better about the <laughs> appropriate caveats applied to this every time you say a confetti pops out of the ceiling yeah <laughs> <Yes>. totally <laughs> yeah. so 10 years from now okay like we know for example we will be making an artificial arm series of artificial arms for people as well as legs like we've already got line of sight to designing a leg so we know we're going to be doing that Okay, so then what other parts of the body could you could you easily, relatively easily port these concepts over to? These concepts being like the robotics and the neural interface and all that. Okay, spines, yeah, absolutely. Well, it was funny actually, a spine surgeon who um, uh, found out about us, actually one of the first things he ever he ever did uh, when he started working with us is he emailed me, he's like, hey, you need to make spines. And I was like, oh, hi, I don't know if we should make spines. <laughs> you know, like, that's pretty, that's pretty big deal. And uh, he's like, no, you don't understand. Like this, this actually makes a lot of sense because it's, you know, it's something that you pose and uh, it uses the nervous system. And I was like, oh, wow, okay. He might actually be onto something. Now the level of risk with that is high, but. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine for many people, it, like the, they are coming from a place of like only upside or, or minimal downside. I mean, if, it, if I'm envisioning it as a internal, like not an, not an external spine support, but like, I don't know. I don't know what you're describing, but feel free to correct me. I, no, I, I think literally what I'm describing is an artificial spine, part and all of an artificial spine. Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's just, you know, your spine is basically a big nerve that runs in the middle of it that spiders out into real nerves, you know, baby nerves. Is and he suggesting replacing surrounded. the nerves, nerves or just the structure of the spine and sort of the uh you know in really all of the above but i think what he's really getting at and what most spine surgeons have talked to us about is like you know it's not so much the um people who have like one tiny little vertebrae or something uh that gets hurt which is certainly a serious problem but it's people who have you know pretty severe complex trauma who probably need to get their spine replaced and would otherwise be paraplegic or um you know quadriplegic so yeah yeah so 10 years call it uh you know a handful of artificial limbs. And I see other companies out there working on other things um, like artificial eyes. Now is that, I don't know if that means they're bionic uh, or if they're just kind of more like something you put on your eye. I think what we're interested in is like taking, you know, like true replacements. Um, 20 years, I think you should definitely expect to see like serious restoration of people who have serious complex impairment to either start electively replacing, you know, the kind of the kind of the most extreme cases electively replacing. We have, I think, like maybe 500 or 1000 people on our wait list who said that they want to electively replace their limb because it's useless. Basically, it's like people who had like their arms smashed, but they couldn't get it amputated. They kind of salvaged it, but it's just non-functional. Um, or, you know, things like um, all the brain implant companies, the brain computer interface companies that are going on right now, like definitely makes sense to put a shunt in and wirelessly send signals from your brain over to the limb because the nerve itself is the problem there right you can't get the signal through the nerve 50 years from now 100 years from now i, I can't see any reason why you know you wouldn't effectively be able to replace the major parts of your body at least that gets into a different question though which is like okay how much do you really need to replace of the body if you wanted a fully artificial body and to be clear i'm not talking i'm not talking about like you know, people who just electively replace them again, still people who need to replace probably their whole body for some series of reasons. And, uh, you know, do you actually need a respiratory system, uh, and a digestive system? If you start kind of replacing lots of parts of your body, um, these things, you know, grew over millions of years of evolution and they're very needed for us in meat based bodies. But, you know, I, I think it's going to look very different than people expect. I would definitely think that the future is going to look a lot weirder than people would think, like in a in a heartwarming way. But it's definitely going to feel a little a little weird at first. Yeah. Is is there um, what's the most fundamental essence? Is it just like keeping the brain alive? Like, is this is this like the, you know, kind of Futurama heads in tanks? Uh. I don't think so. I think others might disagree with me. I think, okay, so nervous system, maybe not brain, you know, so your nervous system spiders out over your whole body, right? So you've got your brain, your brainstem, your spinal cord, all the peripheral nerves that go out to innervate your muscles. Um, you know, you sure. I mean, it, nerves are basically just electrical wires. I mean, they're electrochemical in the way they work, but they're basically just electrical wires, you know, like all the nerves in your arm are like half the size of my pinky. You, know, you can see them with the eye. Uh, so, you know, you'd need to replace that if you didn't, you can't, it's not just a brain in a jar for sure. Yeah. Cause how else are you going to control your arms and your legs and, and all your, you know, autonomic nervous system stuff? Like how does your heart function if there's no nerves running to it? You have to have electrical signals running to and from it. So that, that's pretty deep, deep stuff though, that I definitely wouldn't worry about for a long time. You know, I think the next 10 to 20 years are going to be certainly more than exciting enough <laughs> for a lot of people. Well, it's a, yeah. it's a complex system, the body, like, you know, if you, people are, we're now still just learning the connections between like gut health and brain health or like, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there that you're like, we'll, we may lose parts of ourselves without realizing what we're losing, um, as, as you like slowly lose functions. But, um, this is like I the problem that like all the cryo companies have to solve, by the way. You know, like if you want to get your body cryologic cryogenically frozen, like do you want your brain 
frozen or do you want your whole body frozen? Because by the way, they all have both packages and you can do the brain for cheaper. I don't know that I would do that, but yeah. You wouldn't do just your brain. You would do whole body. No, I would do full body. That seems insane to me that I would, you would just choose your head. I, I get it. Some people have to, or, you know, it's to each their own, but yeah, I, your nervous system is definitely part of who you are because it informs how you interact with the world. Uh, so yeah. Is, is there, um, are, are you already seeing requests or do you foresee as part of this market? Like, um, sort of, I don't, I don't know if this falls in the class of voluntary, but just like as the body degrades, but the mind, you know, stays fine. People, you know, instead of replacing a hip, replacing a leg at, you know, 70 or 80 or something that, cause a lot of, a lot of the really nasty stuff starts to happen when elderly people fall for the first time or like that's that spiral takes place. And so if you can sort of get ahead of that to some extent with, with augmentation of stronger limbs as people start to lose muscle mass, but I don't, I don't know enough to know if their nerves are also degrading. Like, can they, do they still have enough sort of wherewithal to control like well-functioning robotic limbs and sort of extend lifespan that way? Or health I mean, span, they're all solvable say. problems, at least. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. They're all solvable problems, right? Like, if you have a nerve that's impaired, you can potentially put a shunt in, you know, and wirelessly send signals. But yeah, I mean, there's what, a million people in the US every year who get a knee or a hip replaced? Like, it's a lot. Uh, didn't Al's dad or something just get his hip replaced? I think. I don't know. Uh, was it your dad? I don't know. <laughs> Someone's dad. I, anyway, but yeah, like, um, you know, uh, someone in my family just got their knee replaced. And, you know, one of the conversations was like, okay, well, how much of the leg are we talking here? Is it literally just the knee? You know? And yeah, I mean, aging and mobility, we have definitely switched as a species now. To your point, as a species, we are no longer in acute condition risk mode. We are in chronic condition risk mode, right? Like, we've solved so many of the things that would have killed us at age 20, 30, 40, 50. And now we're living 70, 80 years old, which is amazing. Some people live past 100. That's awesome. But now we're basically facing, okay, well, what are the major risks for us? diabetes, congestive heart failure, mobility, and everyone's body gets worse as they get older. You can't get around that. It's just degradation. And uh, so I would definitely expect people will start electively replacing more than just a knee and a hip. I mean, what, what's different about it, you know, other than you're just replacing more or less at the end of the day, I think there's, I think to, to us, the risk the, has to be worth the reward basically, or the other way around. Like, in the same way that brain computer interfaces, like I, I think everyone, all, you know, there's all this snark kind of being thrown around there all the time, like on social media, of like, oh, would you really open up your head for like a, like a Neuralink implant or something? Like, well, that's not the question, man. Like <laughs> there are millions yeah. of people in the world who literally need these right now, who have different impairments and disabilities. And then sure, in 20 years, when we have it, all the risks and the safety you know, stuff sort of solved, quote unquote, like, I don't think the FDA is just going to be like, oh, yeah, go nuts, have fun. You know, like, <laughs> that's not going to be optional until it's even safe enough in the yeah. US, at least. Now I should be careful. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, 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 people like throw that out, forgetting that it is a slow process of like, yeah, the, the necessary like cases and then the early adopters and then the early majority. And then you're like, oh, shit, I'm getting left behind by the people with Neuralink, let's say. And like that, you know, th it's all about context. That decision will become very rational for a lot of people given different contexts. I mean, people are doing it today. People are electively replacing limbs today. It's just that they're often, you know, being replaced with either. I think there's 100 people in the world who've gotten an arm transplant. Um, Whoa. which is pretty crazy, but yeah, that's like tricky, right? Because now you have to take, um, anti-rejection drugs your whole life because it's like replacing a heart. It's not an organ, it's a limb, but your body doesn't think it's yours. So you have to take re anti-rejection medication for the rest of your life, which is an immunosuppressant. So you're at risk. Of Whoa. Stuff. Yeah. So like, you know, sure. I think that like bioengineering and tissue manufacturing will get there at some point too. But even then, I, th I still just think it's going to be a conversation of like, well, why wouldn't you have a synthetic limb at that point then? You know, like just combine both, combine the best of the material science we have uh, with biologics. You know, you don't have to just do biologics. Yeah. Um, I, I realize I want to close a loop that we, we left open earlier. So we talked about the prices um, of like existing solutions today, but I don't know that we actually got to like what you think you can deliver this for. Um, and I think that's an important thing if you're, if you're willing to share, 
I mean, I know it's like, do we tiptoe around it? Do we? <laughs> no, uh, we're happy to talk about that because that's a core part of what we're doing. So here's here's the punchline. Uh, okay, so those the two I said earlier, the hook arms are twenty six thousand dollars, and the myoelectric arms are one hundred ninety five thousand dollars on average in the U S. So what we're doing, our core value proposition to our customers is very simple. It's we are aiming for beyond the state of the art functionality, so greater than those one hundred ninety five thousand dollars arms as affordable or less than a hook arm, that $26,000 arm. And insurance approves like over 90% today for the hook arms. So we know, you know, they're, and they've also signaled to us, I gotta be careful what I say there, but they've signaled to us that they're excited about that prop, that value prop, because it's like, oh man, you're telling me we can finally give people something that they actually want and we can afford it? Awesome, you know? Uh, like our, um, our confidence level, kind of, maybe that's the thing I'll be a little bit more careful about, to the spirit of your question, yeah, no, man, this is on lock, like a hundred percent. We know we're gonna hit that. I, I won't awesome. say like what our bill of materials and stuff are, but yeah, that's definitely we're gonna be offering a very competitive price point. I think that's incredible. after this, the industry will look very different. I mean, that's just incredible engineering that goes into that and, and work to like keep that down and uh, just be disciplined. And, and I think that's a credit to you in thinking like an entrepreneur back from a customer and value perspective, not just, you know, like an academic of can we do it or somebody with who's like perhaps a little more um, or less aligned of an operator in the healthcare space who asks like, can we get paid for it? Like, let's close that whole loop, deliver some fucking value where people are stoked to pay this and, and they have something that's a life changing product experience for them. That's a, it's all it's got to be, you know, don't make it more complicated. You know, it's like we've talked about this kind of stuff in the past. Like to me, business is actually very simple. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it's very simple. Make a product, tell people about it. Make it and then do marketing. Marketing is just telling people about what you made. It's not that hard, you know, like uh, it's not super easy either because you got to figure out how to do it for your market. And, you know, you got to find the right price point. And you got to develop partnerships and all that kind of stuff for sure. But yeah, I... Uh, and yeah. and those are those are variable too. When you make a product that is as obviously staggeringly better as this is, the story tells itself. And when you're working with a community that I think is as uh, well entwined or well um, well networked as the community that you serve, like I think the market is going to take care of itself <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> um, that's kind of what we're seeing, right? I mean, the wait list yeah. at this point is just like, you know, pure word of mouth now uh, yeah. and yeah. just watch it grow. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, if you, it's where you get to reap the rewards of all the hard work you did on the on the machine engineering side. Um, and I, I'm so excited to see this actually get out in the world. What's the what's the um, I don't know. What, what do you how do you see the next, I don't know, 6, 12, 18 months playing out? I'm sure you got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. I mean, besides just playing with the toys in the office, that's like the best part. But yeah. Strapping on all the arms and running around. Yeah, like yeah, Exactly. <laughs> oh, man, I haven't even done that. Actually, my barber, I, like, I got my hair cut recently. He's like, hey, uh, is that arm ready yet? And I was like, what, what do you mean? Why do you ask? He's like, well, I wanted to cut people's hair, man. Like, I wanted to, I want to put them on the chairs in here. Like, no bullshit. That's actually what he said. I was like, all right, I don't know that you want to do that yet, right? Like, <laughs> probably. No, no scissors yet. No scissors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the next 6, 12, 18 months are very clear to us. You know, like I said, we're nearly uh, to our production intent design and rapidly approaching clinical trials. So that's what the next several months look like is landing the production intent design, number one. Number two, going through clinical trials, which is actually a fairly low burden for prosthetics. It's not like drugs where it's like 10,000 people over years. You know, it's like just it's very low <laughs> without okay, getting too good. into it. And uh, you, you got to do FDA pre-submission and submission in there. We know we have to get cleared by the FDA. We absolutely respect that. And we're looking forward to working with them. Uh, and then it's going to market. So that's basically the next you know, 12 to 18 months. Um, we've got all the preclinical data gathered. We've got all the videos. We'll be posting a lot more videos now, too. Cool. So definitely. I They're think you so saw satisfying. Maybe that, that, yeah, that soda can one where he's pouring the water. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that was a fun day. Yeah. Oh, uh, God, it must be so satisfying to like, watch, watch people have that epiphany and that experience. We don't even most it is for sure. Yeah, I, I but before I go into a tangent, I honestly it's emotional, man. Like every time someone comes in and tests one of these, if it's their first time, they always have the same experience, especially if their family is there. Someone starts crying. 
then we start crying. <laughs> it's just, oh, God, this is amazing. And then, you know, second, third, fourth time, every time people come in, like, we don't even have to bring the caffeine, man. They walk in like, all right, what are we doing today? What are we testing? What do I get to pick up? What do I get to push? What do I get to pull? It's so much fun. And at this point, we actually, uh, we, you know, we used to script the user tests and say, like, oh, we want you to try these different activities. Now we're starting to get to the point where it's like, what do you want to do today? Right? Let's go ham with this thing. Like, what, what do you want to try? We got all these things around the office. Try playing with them. See what happens. That's actually how the the video of the gentleman who poured the water out of the soda can, that's actually how it happened because he, uh, I think it was literally, we were testing like a Febreze bottle or something. And he was like pulling the trigger on the Febreze bottle, which again, you can only do when you have individual finger control. Uh, and so anyway, he was doing that. And then he was like finishing this Coke Zero and we're like, looked around like wait a minute and he's like should should i pour this out and then he, he had finished it was like put water in it put water in it and then he <laughs> the first try literally the video we posted i don't think we said this when we posted it and it went like fairly viral on instagram uh we didn't say but that was his first try doing that he had in 11 years he hadn't since he lost his limb he hadn't poured out anything like he hadn't poured you know a can or whatever because he just couldn't there's no device that could do that so hitting it on his first try was crazy. That's awesome. It's so one of the most mind blowing things to me is how much innate uh, intuition. I'm sure there's a technical term for it that I don't know, but intuition, talent, skill, like the the training feedback loop that people go through to learn how to use this thing that you built them is is wild. That's crazy too, because it's literally less than five minutes. And I think that every time I say that to someone, it blows their mind. It's like do it one time, put it on. You say, all right. All right, Eric, you, I'm so sorry you lost your arm above your elbow, but below your shoulder, but you know, we got you, right? And it's okay, Eric, with your phantom thumb that you can see that we can't, but you can feel it, flex it in, extend it out with your wrist, rotate it in, rotate it out. And machine learning system takes these snapshots. Five minutes later, you're good to go. I actually, wait, when this isn't airing, or you're not publishing this today, right? Okay, so I could tell you something because this will have aired by the time this publishes. So uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the BBC came by, like BBC, BBC, like the news organization, because they were they had found out what we were doing and they were really excited about it. And we had uh, it's I think it's literally airing today at like 430. It's going to air on BBC. There is a 20 minute uh, segment they produced about us for BBC Click. And we had the privilege of working with um, this really awesome guy uh, named Paul Carter, who's a journalist for BBC. Paul was, uh, he was born with a limb difference. So um, on his arms and on his legs, um, he didn't start, he didn't keep developing past his elbows and his knees. And uh, I apologize if Paul ever listens to this and I get that slightly wrong, but that's what, um, how I would best describe it. And Paul, after four hours of filming, kind of looked at us, you know, and he's like, so maybe can I try this thing? You know, like, cause he came by, he was filming a test user. And we didn't, we hadn't made a socket for him. So he couldn't use the physical arm, but he used the virtual arm because we have this whole, you know, virtual app uh, where you, like on your computer, your phone or a TV, you can just see like you, a- You uh, can put the cuff on. on and see the rendering of the movements that you're trying to tell it to make. Exactly. It just, it's like a, it looks like a video game environment. Yeah. It's just this, it's our concept arm in three dimensional space with physics and you can move it around uh, just like you would the physical arm. It's one-to-one. -one. I think it was like literally 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds he was off and running. We just told him, hey, you know, as much or as little as you want to train. And he trained up the elbow to open and close, the wrist uh, to do at least one degree of freedom in the hand to open and close. He didn't do the individual fingers. And it was like 30 seconds in, he was controlling this stuff. And the honestly, the footage of him doing that was very, very humbling. You know, it was like, okay, I think that was the moment a lot of us on the team sort of realized yeah, I, I think we all knew we were onto something, but we might really be onto something here. You know, that was pretty special. And I'm really thankful for him coming by and doing that. Yeah, I, I think it, it is so, uh, it is so cool. It must be so rewarding to work on something that's so important, like emotionally impactful, like massively life changing to every single one of your customers. Like the, I don't know. I've never had the privilege to work on a product that literally brings people to tears when they experience it for the first time. Um, but I think we should all be so lucky. And that's a great, uh, it's a great thing to aspire to. I agree. Plus one. I mean, maybe uh, when I was working on online comments back in the day, I had to brought people to tears, <laughs> but in a different direction. <laughs> no, yeah. 
Absolutely. Building a marketplace for home services uh, rarely moved people <laughs> to tears, uh, in my experience, in a positive yeah, direction. Right. Is um, that when we met, by the way? I think you were there like yeah. however many decades ago that was at this point. Yeah, we were in San Francisco, early 2010s. Like, yeah, right. It was a special time. It was. It was a good time. Um, San Francisco is a special place because it brings it brings like our kind of nuts all together in in close proximity and. Um, you get to all kind of cheer each other on and learn from each other. And, um, it's a, it's, it's such a good experience. Um, I, I hope to achieve some of that virtually with this. Like that's my, that's my goal. That's, I want that goal for you. And obviously like you get to see all this stuff, you know, before everyone else does. So <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah, it's a huge part of the fun. Um, but I'm, I'm like, so, um, you're, you're going to object to, to some of these, uh, labels, I think, but I'm, I'm like narrowing in on like the right, who I'm trying to find and, and elevate and invest in is obsessive geniuses building utopian technologies. Um, and I think this is like, yeah, I, I like that. Adam is an incredible example. Um, and, and I love how you've approached this and everything that you're putting into it. And I can't wait to see the future that unfolds as a result of all this hard work. And I hope it inspires many others to sort of pick up and, and charge behind you in the same fashion. That, uh, that really means a lot, man. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I definitely take that to heart. I really appreciate the words of support there. I don't know about, uh, genius obsessive for sure. <laughs> definitely obsessive, but mostly just over like Coke zero. So how, how can those of us who believe in the future that you'd like to manifest um, support you, support Adam, support the vision, or just like follow along and experience the catharsis of uh, moving videos of user testing, the only moving user testing videos that we know of? Yeah, we only post our videos to Be Real, the social network Be Real, that is now no longer exists. Uh, okay, so, no, I appreciate you asking. There's a lot of places people can follow us for a lot of different reasons. And the, the three I would call out is, one, if you're someone who has limb loss or knows someone who has limb loss, best thing you could do is sign up for the wait list. You know, it, it's not like you have to pay any cash for a deposit or anything. We literally just ask for your information and then we'll get on a call with you if you want and learn more about you and, and uh, maybe invite you to test the arm. Um, here in person uh, at HQ. Um, you can do that at adamlims.com, just adamlims.com or adamlims.com slash waitlist. Um, A-T-O-M. A-T-O-M. Mm. Thank you. Ho yes. Homonyms are the worst. You know, I, if someone would have told me that, if someone could have had the decency to tell me that when we started <laughs> this company, geez. <laughs> Uh, the second is um, we do actually have an open crowdfunding round, right? equity crowdfunding round right now uh, at wefunder.com slash Adam Limbs, like you and me, we, wefunder.com slash Adam Limbs. And, you know, we're already backed by some of the best VCs in the world. Obviously, yourself, Bone, Al at Rolling Fund. It's just a joy to work with you guys all the time. But also um, Moai Capital, J4 Ventures, uh, Trevor Blackwell, you know, co-founder of Y Combinator is one of our angel backers. Um, so we try to open these crowd rounds as often as we can, because I just think that's part of the story of what we're doing. You know, we're trying to do this in a different way, you know, build a company for everyone. Uh, and then the third is um, certainly, you know, for anyone uh, who works in the media, who's excited by what we're doing, I think that there's nothing better they could do than send me an email, you know, just Tyler Hayes at adamlims.com and come by and play with the toys here at Palo Alto. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible story to tell. I, I can't wait to see more of them get out there and man, we see these first things, their first arms like hit the market um, and people start to see them out in the real world. It's going to be a really incredible day. I don't know what that first thing has to be, but is it like two people with arms cheersing with a beer? I'm not really sure. Like what's that? The first one out there. I don't know. Taking ideas. Give me your feedback. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a, a question on the wait list. It's like, what the, what's the first thing you'll do? <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll start asking yeah. that, and I'll be sure to uh, put your email in that field so that all the feedback will go directly to you. I would love it, yeah. And then we should just send all the perverts straight to the back of the line. We will sort them <laughs> out right away. <laughs> perverts? What are you talking about? There's no perverts out over there. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's a whole other podcast. We'll do that one. That's the uh, uh, Smart Friends After Dark episode. Yeah, yeah. We. Uh, I can't wait to record that one. <laughs> <laughs> record that one beverage, and yeah. never let anyone else hear it ever <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just fall asleep listening to it exactly That's perfect um tyler man i appreciate you uh dedicating your life and your your effort and your hard work to uh to this mission and setting such an amazing example for for other founders for other entrepreneurs um and for spending some time 
fucking around with me today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, fuck it around, fuck it up. Sure. Hey, likewise, <laughs> Eric. I appreciate it. Likewise for everything you were doing. It's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Join us. Join us in the, <laughs> on the frontier of exactly. fuck aroundery and technology. <laughs> it's, it's never been more fun. It's only going to get crazier. Uh, See, you're just in. spitting out great branding right now. Smart friends fuck around should be your in-person event series. Oh, yeah. I, that'll get misinterpreted. Okay, withdrawn. Yep, fair <laughs> point. <laughs> okay, we're going to workshop that one. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. I re- I re- it's great. It's always such a joy talking to you, man. I appreciate it.